Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church of Pittsburgh, Ohio. I'm Pastor Mel Musser, and I'm very happy that you joined us for worship this morning. We are gathered via video on this day of Pentecost, the day God breathed the breath of life into the church, and the church received the gift of the Holy Spirit, which changes us from being, well, just a gathering of friends into the living body of Christ. If we were all together, I would have invited you to wear something red to church this morning. But since we're apart, I ask uh, that if you go out of your home today uh, at any time, maybe you could put on something bright and red. Uh, it'll make you feel better. Uh, it'll be more colorful, and if somebody asks you why you're wearing such bright colors, it'll give you the opportunity to let them know about the Holy Spirit and how God is still active and present in the body of Christ, the church today. So now, we begin our time of worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As we remember and give thanks for the gift of baptism, let us also remember this is where we each received the promised gift of God's Holy Spirit. We are joined to Christ in the waters of baptism. So let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O Lord, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and you created us in your image, and you planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the Good Shepherd to lead us to still waters. And at the cross, you watered us from Jesus' own wounded side. And on this day, you shower us once again with the waters of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for the waters that fill the oceans, rivers, streams, and lakes, and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, in your grace, and your love. Satisfy the thirst that gives us life only you can give. To you, O Lord God, be honor, praise, and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
And now let us pray. O oh God, on this day, you opened the hearts of your faithful people by sending into us your Holy Spirit. Direct us by the light of that Spirit that we may have a right judgment in all things and rejoice at all times in your peace through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture readings for today are read for us by P.J. Musser. Thank you, P.J. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The psalm for today is Psalm 104. How many manifold are your works, O Lord, in wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, with its swarms too many to number, living things both small and great. There go the ships to and fro, and Leviathan, which you made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food in due seasons. You give it to them, they gather it, you open your hand, and they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever, O Lord. Rejoice in all your works. You look at the earth, and it trembles. You touch the mountains, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please God. I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Hallelujah. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same Spirit. There are varieties of service with the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities. But it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. 
To each is given the manifestations of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Here ends the readings. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so happy that you could be here with us today. I hope you've had a great week and that you've been safe. Today is a very special day in the life of the church. We call this the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a really big word, but it just means 50 days. Today is 50 days since Easter Sunday. Last week, if you remember, I told you that 40 days after Easter, Jesus ascended into heaven. Well, just 10 days later, God sent the church the greatest gift of all, the gift of his Holy Spirit. That would, that's what makes today so special. We thank God and we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. So to help us understand what that means, I brought with me this morning a couple of balloons. Now, you can have a lot of fun with balloons, and they come, as you can see, in many different shapes and sizes. Sometimes clowns, they can blow them up and make animal shapes and stuff out of them. And um, I've even played a game where you blow up the round balloons and you sort of bat them up in the air and you try to see how long you can keep them up in the air without hitting the ground. It's a lot of fun to play with balloons. So um, both of these balloons I'm holding are very nice balloons. Um, and uh, the color of them, I, I picked red ones because, uh, and my red shirt today symbolizes the fire of the uh, Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire that came onto the heads of all of the people that were in church on that Pentecost Sunday that was just 50 days after the first Easter. So can anybody tell me what these balloons need in order to make them fun to play with? Yeah, everybody knows that. They need air inside of them. So um, let's see if we can fill this balloon up with some air. Well, that one's got a little bit of air, but there's still a lot of room for more. I think this can help us to learn something about the church. Remember the disciples of Jesus? Well, they were kind of like this airless balloon. Uh, they didn't have much life in them, the early church, the disciples, and then they were called the apostles later. Um, but on that very first Pentecost Sunday, God filled up the disciples and the and the early church, all the people that were there. Just like I filled up this great big balloon, God filled up the early church. And he made, and when God did that, just like I, when I filled up this balloon, I made it a lot more fun to play with, a lot more uses you can use this balloon for. The same thing is true with the church. When God filled the church with his Holy Spirit, he empowered us. He gave us power so that we could go out and do the things that God has asked us to do and all those things that God has commanded us to do. It reminds me when I'm filling up this balloon that God also used his breath 
um, at the beginning, back in the beginning when God created man uh, and women, that God breathed into them and, ga and gave them life. And then also when you were baptized, as most of you were baptized as little babies, um, that's when God breathed into you and gave you the Holy Spirit that now lives inside of you. And so just remember, just like this balloon, it needs a lot of air um, so that it can be used for what it's intended to be. You and I need the Holy Spirit to fill us so that we can be everything that God wants us to be also. So let's pray. We thank you, O oh God, for sending your, your Holy Spirit to us. We thank you for breathing life into the church and we thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to all people who believe in Jesus as their Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, boys and girls, for joining us this week. I hope you have a very safe and happy week. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye for now. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 20th chapter, verses 19 through 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw it was the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the Gospel of our Lord. And now it's time for our children's message. I'll pause for just a couple of seconds to allow the children to come closer in order to get a good view. And now it's time for our sermon message for today. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the one who breathes life into us, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The great novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald, he uh, wrote The Great Gatsby. Well, he also once said, there are no second acts in America. Well, Fitzgerald might be a much more famous author than I will ever hope to be, but I know him to be totally wrong about second acts. There's plenty of them, and they're all around us. Take Ken, for example. Um, growing up, all Ken ever wanted to be was a doctor. He did pre-med at Duke University and then went to medical school at the University of North Carolina. And after completing his residency in New Orleans, he moved to Los Angeles and he practiced medicine for the Kaiser Medical Group. Well, somewhere along the way, Ken got bit by the acting bug and he started doing stand-up comedy and he began to audition for some acting parts, roles. This was a surprise to everybody that knew him since he'd never even shown an interest in theater in high school. Well, he got his break in a series of movies and then uh, ABC decided to um, write a TV sitcom around his life. If you remember it, it was called Dr. Ken. His name is Ken Jeong and he is now a full-time comedian and actor. Entertainment was his second act in his life, but still Dr. Ken renews his medical license each year. You never know when you need to use it. Occasionally he has to. One time he jumped off stage during a stand-up routine and had to help a woman who was having a seizure in the audience. Another example of great second act uh, comes from our own American history, President Teddy Roosevelt. Well, he was a big star in the New York legislature in his early uh, adult life. Uh, life. Uh, he was wildly successful in that first act of his life's career. 
But uh, he lost his wife and his mother on the same day when he was just 25 years old, and that devastated him. And according to historians, he went out to the badlands of South Dakota to escape his depression by riding his horse like 15 hours a day. In time, he felt ready to go back to work again, and he decided to take whatever job came his way. He started working for the United States Civil Service Commission, and then in New York, uh, he served as New York City Police Commissioner. Then he joined the United States Army, where his leadership qualities were further developed, and he became the New York Governor. Then he moved on to be uh, elected as Vice President of the United States, and finally, he was elected as president. And then, after his presidency, his image was chiseled into the cliffs of Mount Rushmore. So, no second acts? F. Scott Fitzgerald, really? That's kind of ridiculous. Teddy Roosevelt had second, third, fourth, maybe even fifth, sixth, and seventh acts in his life. Sometimes it's a winding path that leads us to the place where God wants us to be all along. That place where we've learned from the school of hard knocks how to be a good leader or a good follower. In Roosevelt's case, he wouldn't have become an excellent president as he was unless he had had a number of different jobs, some of which admittedly were lateral moves. They were not definitely not promotions, but the experiences were all still extremely valuable. In, in paving the way for what he was to finally do with the rest of his life. In my own life, I've had several opportunities for second acts. I started out wanting to be a doctor like Dr. Ken. Well, that morphed into wanting to fly jet airplanes for the Air Force. Thank God that quickly changed uh, into flying a desk uh, and learning how to lead people as a personnel officer. From there, God nudged me into the seminary. And even after being ordained, I was given the opportunity for a second act when you all called me to be your pastor. I'm a firm believer this world, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, is full of second, third, and fourth, and even more acts. It's never too late to open our eyes of faith and to look for and to listen to the leading of God's Holy Spirit. Of course, second acts are nothing new. In the Garden of Eden, Eve asked God to tell her what Adam was doing over there behind the bush. And God's answer was, he's turning over a new leaf. Second act. On Easter evening, the disciples were traumatized. Yes, they had heard Mary tell them, I've seen the Lord. But they had not spotted the risen Jesus with their own eyes. With the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus fresh in their minds, they were probably suffering from some pretty serious PTSD. For certain, they were scared. John tells us the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. After Jesus was killed in such a brutal fashion, no one knew what kind of violence might come their way. Their first act as disciples was over, and their second act, at least for the moment, it didn't look very promising. And then suddenly Jesus came to them and said, Peace be with you. He passed through the locked doors and was suddenly standing there, right there in their midst. For the disciples, this was the beginning of their second act. Grief was suddenly replaced with joy. Despair was quickly transformed into hope. Jesus had promised them their pain will turn into joy, and their mourning was about to turn into dancing. His appearance proved everything that Jesus had told them beforehand was about to come true. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And this time he added, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Before they could even completely process the good news of the resurrection, Jesus was already sending them on mission. Notice what happens at the beginning of a second act. It's action. Ken Jeong 
Dr. Ken, he didn't sit around by the pool out there in L.A. He went on auditions, and he got himself those acting jobs. Teddy Roosevelt didn't hang out in the Badlands forever riding his horse. Both of those people jumped into action pursuing new passions. They both took a leap of faith, not fully aware where that leap was going to land them, but they trusted enough to follow where their faith and the Holy Spirit was leading them. Jesus ordered his disciples into action. Even while they were still cowering behind locked doors, I send you, he said, right before pushing them back out into the world. Starting over is scary. Yet Jesus calls his followers to second acts and third acts and so forth. I've learned from my experiences with second acts and following the leading of the Holy Spirit. When God sends us out, many times we look around and we think, I can't, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough or I'm not articulate enough. And the list of excuses goes on and on for why we can't do what Jesus has called us to do. Jesus knew our human nature. So after saying that he was sending them out, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't want his disciples to begin their second act without the power that they were going to need. He knew it would be unfair of him to push them into action without giving them the gifts that they needed to be effective out in the world. And so he breathed on them and he filled them with the Holy Spirit. He inspired them on Easter Day with the same, the very same Holy Spirit that would descend on all of the apostles in the rush of a mighty wind on this day, the day of Pentecost. I noticed the echoes of scripture in this verse. When Jesus breathed on the disciples, I'll bet they were reminded that God breathed life into Adam way back in the book of Genesis. And in today's reading, I'm also reminded of the book of Ezekiel, where God breathed the breath of life into all those dry, dead bones. When Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on his disciples, he made them a new, a second creation, a new creation. Those who believe in Jesus receive new life as children of God. It's a second act. It's a new life and a new inspiration. It's the power of the risen Jesus breathed directly into his followers. But why did Jesus go all, all the way through all of this? Was it just to show God's power and glory or is there some bigger purpose for God and for Jesus giving us this gift of the Holy Spirit? In giving his disciples the breath of life and the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus also empowered his disciples for mission. And that mission is to forgive. That's the biggest, the bigger purpose behind empowering us with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. In our catechism, we call this the office of the keys. In this verse, Jesus empowered his followers, both then and now, to continue his mission in the world. Since Jesus was sent to offer God's unmerited love and forgiveness, we call that grace, that's exactly what Jesus also empowers us to do, to share God's unmerited love and forgiveness, to share God's grace with the world. The disciples have now entered their second act, one that involved action, power, and forgiveness. The risen Jesus sent them on a mission, filled them with the power of the Holy Spirit, and gave them the ability to forgive sins and help people know about their God who loves them. Whether wherever we are in life, we can have a second act. You can have a second act too. We too can follow Jesus in a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit and focused on action, power, and forgiveness. 
And so this day, on this day of Pentecost, I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead you into your second act. Let's call it your next act, because like me, you may have already had three or four other acts already that have played out. And may, may Jesus, in the, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, give you new power and a new purpose and sending you out on that same mission that Jesus began and then turned over to you. Some of us may be on our third or fourth acts by now. And I can tell you this, when you're following the Holy Spirit, it's always an adventure of love. God bless you this week and always. Amen. <laughs>
Evangelical Lutheran Church of Pittsburgh, Ohio, we pray, come Holy Spirit. And for everyone who searches for you, O Lord, we pray, come Holy Spirit. Restore with your breath the whole creation, especially the lands and waters laden with pollution and the animals whose habitat are threatened. For your earth, O Lord, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Send your spirit upon the leaders of nations, on legislatures, and on judges, that the people of the world will benefit from your justice and especially from your peace. For the nations of the world, O Lord, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Visit all who are suffering, all who feel hopeless, and all who face death. Send healing to those we name before you, now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. For all who are in need, we pray to you, O Lord, come, Holy Spirit. Restore to health those who have contracted the COVID-19 virus. Uphold health workers, grant jobs to those who are unemployed, and assist researchers in discovering a vaccine. For all who are confronting the coronavirus, O Lord, we pray, Come, Holy Spirit. Bless those who are graduating from schools and universities. Give our youth hope for their future. For our graduates, O oh Lord, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Show our nation and our churches how to connect with those whose language we cannot speak. For the speakers of every language under the sun, we pray, O Lord, come, Holy Spirit. As Elizabeth welcomed Mary to her home, give us ways during this time to share with one another the faithfulness we receive from you. Surprise us with unexpected grace. For our family members and friends, we pray, O Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Hear also the cries of our own hearts. For those deep wounds, for those deep needs that we can only share with you. For ourselves, O Lord, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Receive our praise for all who have gone before us in the faith, from the first Pentecost throughout all of Christian history and up to this very day. That at the end, we and all the saints will rejoice in your presence. We pray to you, O Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. And so, with bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. As I share the peace of Christ with you, I once again ask you to pick at least one person each day this week to personally share the peace of the Lord with. Please remember to keep socially distanced at all times. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. The living Lord Jesus Christ is our tie that binds us together. So let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, bring you hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. In everything you do, go in Christ's love, seeking, welcoming, and serving all. Amen. Thank you.